Good evening, and welcome to Leesville First Baptist Church. We're still in the our Bible study in the book of Ecclesiastes, but we're getting close to the end. We're up to chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Lord, we continue to pray for revival. That you would take your people and draw them close to you. That you would lead us deeper into your word and to your thought that we might know your heart and your will better. That we might understand what you are about and what you would have us do. Lord, we pray for those who are faithful to you and we pray for those who have backslidden. That you would draw them back to you. Back to worship. And back to obedience. For some have not left the church but have left obedience. We pray that you would lead us into your holiness to be your people as your children to be able to say like our Lord did when he was a boy don't you know I have to be about my father's business lead us in this holiness we beg for the time is short and the darkness is great teach us guide us equip us fill us with your Holy Spirit we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of what we've been saying about Solomon bears repeating. It's the, it's the, the eternal point of the book of Ecclesiastes, namely what happens to the most intelligent, the most wise man in the world, the richest, the most gifted, if he walks away from God. Jesus asks, as I've been saying, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Solomon has lost his soul. He has merged all the gods around him because of his wives and concubines, 1,000. He has respected their gods and blended them into one god. We know this because he doesn't call God by the name the Jews gave him that the priests would use. Yahweh, or if you're a little more old-fashioned, Jehovah. But he uses the word Elohim, which was not the Jewish word. It was originally a Semitic word. It was the word of the, the pagans all around. We have to be careful because we're tempted to do that. To say, well, all the religions are, are good. All the, there are different paths to God. No, there's not. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father, to God the Father, except through him. By incorporating all the religions around us, we walk away from the one true God. He begins with famous words. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Now, I'm amazed as I do research into this, the number of pastors and expositors who get it wrong. They do it because they're reading in the English version only what makes sense to them. And we can't do that. We have to know what the original writers meant. For example, we're told in the fifth commandment to honor our father and mother that our days be long in, in the land that God has given us. Well, the word honor there is the word harden. Now, it was, a, it was a, an expression for stiff-necked people, people who stiffen their necks in pride. And so to honor is literally the word in the Hebrew to stiffen. And the only way you know the difference whether it means to stiffen or to honor, is to look at the context. 
but without knowing the old world, without knowing the Jewish world that Solomon was speaking to, you might be tempted to take that commandment to be harden your father and mother, firm them up, teach them to exercise so that you'll live longer. Now, you see, that would make sense, but it's not what the Bible says. If we look back at what they meant, they meant honor, respect. Respect your father and your mother so that you'll live long. We have to be careful to read the Bible and understand what they meant. What did Solomon mean when he wrote this? You need to know that at the beginning of civilization, the civilization that Solomon was aware of, that it began in three places, along the Nile River, along the where the Euphrates and the Tigris River join in modern-day Iraq and Persia, and in the Indus River in India. Now, in all three cases, every spring, the, the winter snows would melt from mountains where at the beginning of these rivers and would flood the rivers would overflow their banks every spring. And when they did, they would dump new rich soil on the ground around. Now, everybody else in the world had to do what's called slash and burn. We still see that in um, Brazil today in a lot of farmers. You farm the land until it's used up. They didn't have fertilizer, although some did animal sacrifice for the sake of fertilizer. But that's expensive. But in Egypt, along the Nile, again, along the Fertile Crescent, which is where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, and in the Indus River, all you had to do was wait for springtime. The floods would come, and you'd have all new fertile soil. Well, they learned when the waters were low, maybe ankle deep, to cast their, their wheat grain or their barley grain and, pass, and just th cast them out into the water, let them sink and, and fall into the mud. We know this uh, not only from archeological um, evidence, but because today there are cultures that still farm that way. And they'll take their animals, their oxen, and they'll walk up and down, march them up and down the bank, shoving the seeds into the mud. Then when the waters recede, the grain will grow every year. Egypt's grain it was especially so rich that it fed the entire Roman Empire. So cast your bread upon the waters. Those kernels of wheat were edible. And you might say, why should I throw my food out? Now I've lost it. But if you're wise, you'll invest it and you'll have more. That's what he's saying here. Invest. For you cast your bread upon the waters, cast your wheat, your grain upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. It'll grow back and you'll have a much bigger crop, even more seed. You'll have enough seed to feed yourself and your family, maybe even enough to sell to other people, and plenty left over to put in storage, and some of it you'll use next year to start a whole new crop again. If you'll just invest, he's always talking about investment. Invest. How many people refuse to invest? How do we invest today? Well, if you think about it, your years in school were an investment. The state invested an in education into you and you've been benefiting from it all your life. You learn to read, probably at school. Though I know some parents teach their children. You learned the sciences, mathematics, history, and all this education has blessed you all your life. Without an education, our society would collapse. We wouldn't have doctors, we wouldn't have engineers, without an education, we wouldn't have teachers to further our knowledge, to continue it. So he says, invest. 
you need to invest. Invest a few hours a week in exercise. And even if you can't lose weight, you can become healthier. You can become stronger. Invest time, but also invest time spiritually. Read your Bible because it is a love letter from God. And as you read, you know the mind and heart of God better. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. The only way you can know the voice of your shepherd is to have heard him for a number of years. Do you know the voice of Jesus? Or is the family Bible in your home covered with an inch of dust? When's the last time you cracked your Bible and read it? Verse 2, give a serving to seven and also to eight. Now that's that's poetic speech in, um, in Hebrew. It means to a lot. Seven's a perfect number, but go beyond that. Not only invest in yourself, in other words, invest in other people. Why? It says, give a serving to seven, also to eight. For you do not know what evil will be on the, on the earth. Do you know what's happening tomorrow? No, you don't. But these people in whom you invest could make your life better. There was a baseball player whose um, father was uh, a neurologist, a neuroscientist, neurosurgeon, actually. So he was an expert in the brain and its workings and in how to how to dig in there and rescue people. And one day, his son, who was a Major League Baseball player, a first baseman for the Toronto Blue Jays, had a cerebral hemorrhage. Now, you almost always die from that. It, it hit so powerfully that, excuse me, a cerebral aneurysm, I'm sorry, he had a cerebral aneurysm. And it's often fatal. But because dad was a neurosurgeon, he was able not only to save his son's life, but his health. And his son was able to continue playing baseball. Imagine the gratitude that father had towards every teacher, every professor he had ever had. All the practice he had been given, all the work that had been forced upon him when he was a young man that allowed him to save his son. Invest in people because you don't know the evil that's coming. You, this person you help may become the doctor who saves your life, may be, become the policeman who rescues you from danger. Invest in people. The playwright Thornton Wilder, in his um, play The Matchmaker, had a uh, wonderful saying that money is like manure. It's not worth a thing unless you spread it around. What you have needs to be invested. You need to invest in your marriage, how many divorces happen because although we love our spouse, we don't invest in that person. What have you put into your marriage? What are you putting into your children? What are you putting into your church? Church is not just a place where you should go and spectate, watch and be entertained. So many churches today are judged that way. Your church is where you invest in the world by investing in one church. By making that church a place of God. By pouring your money and your work and your sweat into it. You can make the world a better place. I praise God and gratefully thank him for the people who especially sacrificed their time to bless our children.
to bless other people. Do you have a burden for other people? I fear that we've used that expression so much only for evangelism that we've forgotten it means everybody. Especially the church. Have you invested in the people that you call fellow church members? Do you care about their salvation? Do you pray for them? Do you pray for their growth, for their training? Solomon says you better invest because if you don't, evil's going to come and you'll be washed away. Trouble is coming. If the clouds are full, verse 3, the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. They do, for good or bad. You can't stop it. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, that's where it'll lie. You have no say in the matter. Now, what he's saying is, things are coming, some evil things are coming, and you have no say in it. You don't know what tomorrow brings. I remember the story when I was a boy of a man from Alabama who stepped out onto his front porch. And when he stepped off the front porch, walking to his car to go to work, a meteorite went through the small roof over his porch. Had he delayed a, a second more, it would have gone right through his head. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what horrible thing, you don't know what good thing. You don't know what opportunity. It's coming and you can't do a thing about it. Verse 4, he who observes the wind will not sow. Now, this is an expression. If you wait, remember you're casting seed out into the water, and the wind's going to blow it off all, all over the place. But if you decide you're going to wait to the perfect weather day, you'll never cast seed. You'll never have the perfect day. I had a young farmer when I was in my first church who used to laugh about other farmers. He said, listen to us farmers. When it rains, we'll complain that the ground's too wet for our equipment to get out there. And when it's dry, we'll complain that the crops won't grow because they're not getting watered. We're never happy. Solomon says, if you wait till the perfect time, you'll never cast seed. You'll never invest. What's he saying? Invest all the time, no matter, in good or bad, invest. Invest in your church, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Give your life for other people because you don't know. Don't wait for the perfect chance. Don't wait for the right time to tell your children about Jesus. Tell them always. Wait for, just let them tell you when they're ready to listen. And he who regards the clouds, in other words, waits for the perfect weather, will not reap. If you wait for the wind to be perfect, you'll never sow your seed. And if you wait for a day that is good, you guaranteed good weather, you'll never harvest your crop. Because while you're waiting, the rains will come and destroy your now ripe crop. So just work. Just get out there and do the best you can. Don't wait to invest. How many men said, I was going to give my wife a little bit more of my time as soon as I got X, Y, and Z under control? As soon as I dealt with this, I was going to go to her. And now it's too late. How many people said, I was going to take my children and teach them, but I, but I forgot. I, got care I, I lost track of time. And now it's too late to play catch with my son. Now it's too late to spend that time with my daughter before she leaves the house. Don't wait for the perfect time. Invest always. We should spend our lives investing. Now this is great wisdom. Yes, he's lost, but this is good wisdom. Verse 5, as you do not know, what is the way of the wind? You don't know what the weather's going to do. You don't know when the best time is. 
to do whatever it is you've been waiting on. You don't know, so do it while you can. Or how the bones grow in the womb of, who are, of her who is with child. You don't know what's going on. This world is beyond our understanding. So stop waiting to understand before you act. You know what's right. Do it. Do it now. I talked to a woman one time, and I've actually had this conversation in other ways uh, a number of, uh, number of times. But she said, I know I need to give my heart to Jesus, but I'm waiting for him to fill my heart and prove to me before I accept him. And I said, so what you're doing, because you know you need to be with him, what you're doing is wait, saying, I know I need to get wet. I know I need to jump in the water. But I'm not going to jump in until after he makes me wet. Does it work that way? You don't know. So, in the same way, you do not know the works of God who makes everything. We don't understand what God's up to. And I believe we will spend eternity understanding it better and better, but never completely, because God is infinitely profound. Verse 6, in the morning, sow your seeds. As soon as you get up, go to work. Don't waste time. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. Get up in the morning, go to work, and keep going. Now, he's not. this is not about work. This is about investment, remember? And yes, some work is investment. But the idea is don't wait. You'll wish you hadn't later on. If you wait, you'll be sorry. For you don't know which will, which will prosper, the morning or the evening, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. If you say, I'm only going to work in the morning, you may find out later on it would have been just as good to work all, work in the evening too. And you could have done so much more. Verse 7, truly the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. He's changing the subject. Life is good, he says. It's good to sit out on a summer day and look at the sun, to enjoy the sunlight. I know I love to sometimes just go to my backyard and sit there and look at the beauty. Verse 8, but... If a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, if you lived a long life and every single year was good, he said, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. No matter how, if you live a long life and every year is wonderful, just remember, trouble's coming. Remember, this is a man who doesn't believe in life after death. This is the man who has walked away from God. He doesn't trust. Our belief in life after death cannot be philosophical or intellectual. It has to be based on our trust in God. David's the one who said, you won't leave me to rot in the grave. Now, that's a very childish way of putting it, and I love it. I trust you, God, that you're not going to leave me in the grave forever. One day you're going to resurrect me. Your belief, your and my belief in life after death has to be based on our trust in God. Because remember, there's no other name by which we can be saved but Jesus Christ. Do you trust God through Jesus Christ? Has you in the palm of his hand? Do you trust that he will never leave you nor forsake you? It's a childlike faith. But it's the only faith. Solomon, however, says no matter how life is, how good it is, realize one day you're going into nothingness. What, and you bet, no matter how wonderful it's been, one day it'll all be gone. 
It's a miserable way to live. And so many people live that way. The expositor Adam Clark says it like this, because he says, no matter what trouble's coming, he says, if you do, you're either going to live and you're either going to die a violent death when you're young, or you're going to die a lingering death when you're old. But no matter what, you're going to die. Now that's Solomon's wisdom. But we go farther by saying living or dead, I'm in the hands of God. He holds me. That's the comfort we have that no one else has. <clears throat> Rejoice, O young man, verse 9, in your youth. Be happy that you're young. It is an old expression that young men should never wear hats. They should go out in the rain and the sun and enjoy them both with bare heads. It means just this. Rejoice while you're young. Be happy that you're young. Don't waste your time wishing for tomorrow. So many young people say, man, I can't wait till I grow up. Why? Be happy now. I believe as an adult, part of our job is to remember that children are scared to death. We think, we idealize our youth and say, man, I wish I could be young again. The truth was, is when you were young, you were scared because you had no power. You depended on other people for safety, for life. It's our job to help our children enjoy being young, to help them be, to be energetic in their celebration of life. We shouldn't weigh them down. We shouldn't pin them down. We shouldn't nag them so that they can't enjoy being children. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, verse 9 says, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart. That wrote word ways is the road. The path that you want, do it. Chase your dream. When I was a boy, everybody wanted to be an astronaut or a fireman. Whatever your dream is, chase it. Young man, as you get older, compromises will happen. Burdens will be added to you. Chains will come upon you. If you're a Christian, they'll all be good chains, but they'll be chains. The choices you make as a young man will follow you into old age. But chase those dreams while you can. And walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. Now, you might remember that the Bible said every man did what was right or good in his own in his own sight, in his own eyes. It means what you see to be the best. Walk in the way that you think is best. Do what you think is right. Now, I will tell you, if all you do is what you think is right, without the word of God, you're in trouble. Solomon misses that because he's no longer listening to the word of God. Don't you make that mistake. But know that for all of these, God will bring you into judgment. No matter what you do, good or bad, one day God is going to judge you. He's talking about the end of your life. Man, what a wet blanket. Chase your dreams. Be happy while you're young, but realize one day you're going to pay for all of it. Again, this is the best that the lost world can give. Therefore, verse 10, remove sorrow from your heart. Now, the word sorrow there is the word is the expression for the things that cause anger or frustration. Because you're going to die and be judged in death, 
Solomon doesn't believe after death. In other words, you're going to die for the way you lived. And that's true to a point. Spend your life eating bacon, you may die of a heart attack. So remove, remove the things that cause sorrow from your heart while you're young and put away evil from your flesh. Don't do evil things you'll pay for when you get older. Now that's solid wisdom, but oh, we Christians have much more. For childhood, and this is the end of it, hear the sadness in this. For childhood and youth, and by youth he means the prime of life. If you don't believe me, ask any 60-year-old man when is his what he considers to be a young man, he'll say 30, 35. So we're taught, the word here, youth, means the prime of your life. It's literally in the Hebrew, the word dawning. When your adult life dawns and you're young, you still have your youth, you still have your strength, but now you're an adult with all the rights and privileges and power of being an adult. And he says, all of that, your childhood and the prime of your life are vanity. Here today and gone tomorrow. Today, you're a young man, a vibrant man, a powerful man. Tomorrow, it's gone. Today, you're the prettiest girl in town, the smartest. Tomorrow, it's gone. We should invest in people. Yes, for earthly reasons, but also for spiritual. We should pray for others. We should seek to help them grow. Husbands and wives should go to church together, should worship together, should pray together. As we invest in people spiritually, not only do we bless them, and they'll thank us forever for that blessing, but you'll be blessed as well. You will live in a better world if you lead people to Jesus. Think about this for a second. What if you took the worst drug dealer in town, the most violent, the most vulgar, and led him to Jesus Christ, and Jesus flipped his life around. Wouldn't you live better? Wouldn't the community around you be better? Why do we hole up in our private homes and let the world around us go to pot? Solomon's right. We need to invest in ourselves. You need to be about investment in your own life spiritually as well as intellectually and academically and physically. You should invest in your prayer time, in your Bible study time, in your devotional life. But we also need to invest in other people in the same ways. You can change the world by brightening the corner where you are, by taking the dim light that is just you and multitude, mul multiplying it by a large number of lights. Many of them perhaps brighter than you, but that's okay. You started the fire. And you changed the world. You can be a blessing in your church. When you think back on the people who are most memorable in your church, they are the people who sacrificed the most who invested the most. And they won't tell you that they wasted their time. They will say it was a blessing that they invested in fellowship, that they invested in worship, that they invested in music so that others can worship, that they invested in Bible study so that others could be enlightened as to the ways of Jesus Christ. You'll never begrudge whatever it is you pay out whatever it is you invest. 
we finish this Bible study with chapter 12, Lord willing, next week. Be thinking about who you invest in and how you should invest in yourself as well. It'll change your life and it'll change the world around you. Until then, as always, in Christ's service and in yours, I'm your pastor. Good night.